Amen. Now we'll sing our hymn together, O, oh, for a closer walk with God, a calm and heavenly frame, a light to shine upon the road that leads me to the Lamb. together that God will richly bless us. You've seen the announcements already. They've been going around inside. And if you're in late, just let me remind you of the coming Lord's Day. We have Sunday school Bible class, 11.30 morning meeting and the breaking of bread. And I'll be speaking at that meeting. Then half past six at night will be our annual Children's Day service. Now, in line with the government guidance, we can't have the children yet at the front of the church, and unfortunately, this is the second year now that we haven't been able to hold Children's Day, but there will be a service, and that will take the form of a pre-recorded video message from our Sunday School children and our guest speaker, who is Gareth Gwynn of Child Evangelism Fellowship. Now, this is similar to what we had to do with Youth Sunday and also for our Christmas morning. So please do make sure that you listen in and encourage the children by listening in on Sunday night. Now, because of that, there will be no meeting here in the church building on Sunday night. Next Sunday will also be the last morning of Sunday school for the present season, 
and the children will receive their Sunday school prizes this year in their classrooms. So those are all the announcements. And do please remember Sunday in your prayers. Now, turn with me to the book of James again tonight, back to chapter 4. And we're going to read the first 12 verses together in this chapter. James chapter 4, and we're going to read at verse 1. James says, From whence come wars and fighting among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, The Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother, and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law, and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgeth another? Amen. God will add his blessing to this public reading of his word. As you and I looked at the opening verses in James chapter 4 last Wednesday night, we were dealing with strife in the church. Now, we've already noted in James chapter 3 that James has spoken about the word strife, and I suggested to you then, if there is strife in the local church, it's inevitable that it will lead to division amongst the Lord's people. If selfish ambition rules in our hearts and we are guided by earthly wisdom and not the wisdom of God, it is inevitable that we will find ourselves in conflict with others in the family of God. What a solemn question James began with. Where do wars and fights come from among you? I reminded you that the words could easily be translated by the words discord, feuds, conflicts, and even quarrels. So you can see immediately the seriousness of the situation, and you can also see that James is deeply concerned about this by the strong language that he uses in asking this question. Now, we would all be able and love to be able to say, well, you know what? That's not church life for us. We don't see things like that happening in our church. Well, a quick look at the Scriptures would tell us it's not something new for today's church. The Corinthian Christians were at loggerheads over various issues. The Galatian Christians were biting and devouring each other. The Ephesian Christians were exhorted by the apostle to maintain Christian unity. The Philippian Christians were told to strive together for the faith of the gospel. Now, at times, the early church was a picture of great harmony and great peace as the blessing of God rested upon his people, but it wasn't like that all of the time. When we looked at what James said to these people, we noted the reasons, first of all, for their quarreling. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Well, there are some reasons that we've already noted as we've made our way through this particular letter. We know there was a, a difference in class. 
James already spoke about that in James chapter 2 with that example, that picture given to us of the rich man who comes into the assembly and the poor man that comes into the assembly and how that they were both treated very, very differently. So there was a problem between the rich and the poor, to put it mildly. There was snobbery in the church, and it was dividing God's people. But no local church should be like that. If a church doesn't understand the principle that we all are what we are by the grace of God, and that there are no distinctions as far as God is concerned, then it doesn't really understand the grace of Almighty God. Secondly, there were divisions in the church. Those divisions may have been caused by those who wanted to be leaders and who were driving their own agenda. They were promoting themselves above others and prompting their own ideas to the exclusion of others, and it led to conflict. And thirdly, there were unresolved personal issues affecting their fellowship, because James says, verses 11 and 12, do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He that speaks evil of his brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. Now, these believers had personal issues that were affecting their fellowship. They were judging one another, speaking evil of one another, and maybe that's why James said so much in chapter 3 about the use and the misuse of the tongue. But James says, look, you and I are not called to judge others. We're not asked to stand in the place of God, because after all, God knows everything about every single one of us. You and I very often base our judgment on others, and we don't know what's even going on in their hearts and in their homes. But secondly, the real reason for the problem, if Christians love the same Savior, if they're part of the same family, led by the same Spirit, and they live according to the same principles in Scripture, why on earth are there so many divisions amongst them? Well, James sought to give an answer to these people about their problem, and he simply says that one of the reasons for strife and division amongst them was because of their own desires. Their own desires which were selfish, they were living lives that were governed by the wrong motives, and they were even praying in the wrong way. And these people were at war with each other simply because what was going on within was being manifested outwardly amongst each other. There was something wrong within the hearts of these people. But tonight, as we move on here in James chapter 4, we're going to note some important lessons for our spiritual good. Listen again to what James says, verse 4. He says, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the Scripture says in vain, the Spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy, but he gives more grace? Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. Now, there's a lot of very instructive material included in those few short verses. Remember that in the opening verses, James has exposed the strife that was evident amongst these people. And by way of introduction, I've reminded you of some of the things that had caused them to be at war within and at war with each other. But it seems now that James digs a little deeper. And he confronts some further things that were adding to the problems that these believers faced. And not only that, he gives them some great instructions as to how they can solve the problems and as to how they can put these things right. So, beloved, let's think about them for a moment or two, and let's see how we go as we consider what James says. First of all, we note the problems that they faced. As always, James is very pointed in what he says to these people. That's one thing you'll notice throughout this book, that James just doesn't beat about the bush 
He just kneels it on the head immediately. He's precise in what he says. And he says to them here, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the Scripture says in thee, and the Spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy, but he gives more grace. Therefore he says, God resists the proud and gives grace unto the humble. Now as he seeks to expose some of the things that were going on within the lives of these believers that I've said already was being manifested outwardly amongst them, he identifies for us four things. And these four things, beloved, are worth noting because they are still a problem for so many Christians today in the world in which we live. They have been a problem for many Christians down through the era of the Christian church. And there is no doubt that they bring a great challenge to our personal lives. You say to me, but Pastor, what things? Well, first of all, James speaks about adultery. I wonder how you'd feel tonight if I was standing up at this pulpit and I turned around and I said to you, as James said to these people, you adulterers and adulteresses. I think some of you would be at the door and saying to me, Pastor, you'd need to tone it down. You need to make sure you don't use language like that, because that's not the kind of language that we should be using to Christians in a Christian church. And James turns around and he begins that way immediately. He says to them, you are adulterers and adulteresses. Now, those are strong terms. Why on earth would James say that to these people? Is he suggesting that some of them have committed adultery physically? Is he suggesting that some of them have cheated in their relationship with their spouses? Well, that's not what James has in mind. There are many other passages in the Bible that speak about adultery in a different way. You see, what James is saying is this, that here is not a moral problem, but a spiritual one. And in order to understand what James is saying, we have to consider the relationship that these people already had with God. You see, what James is speaking about here is spiritual adultery. Remember in the Old Testament, you'll come across this time and time again in different verses in some books where we get a picture of God being married to his people. Remember what we read, Isaiah 54, verse 5, For thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. And it's made perfectly clear by a man that we often refer to as the gospel prophet. He says that God was a husband to Israel. Now, you and I could spend the, right, the rest of the night on that, but I can't do that, so I'm going to keep this simple. What that simply means is that the people in Israel enjoyed a very special and a very intimate relationship with God. God was a husband to Israel. But the relationship that they enjoyed was marred because Israel proved to be an unfaithful wife. In fact, in Jeremiah 3.20, we read these very solemn words from the prophet, Surely as a wife treacherously departs from her husband, so have you dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, says the Lord. And then Jeremiah follows up that statement with another one. And he speaks about God's unfaithful people, and he says this, Return, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backsliding. 
Beloved, this was a very, very special relationship that Israel enjoyed with God, and God blessed them as a result of it. But then in the midst of the blessing, and in the midst of the intimacy of this relationship, Israel had been unfaithful to God. How did they do that? Well, they had broken God's covenant. They had run after other gods, and they had worshipped them. They had rejected God's ways, and one example is that in their intermarrying with other nations, they had played the harlot. That's biblical language. They had played the harlot. And in all of these ways, and in many other ways, these people had been unfaithful to God. And James says that they had committed spiritual adultery. Ezekiel, Hosea, the prophets, also addressed this issue of spiritual adultery. So, whenever James is writing here to a Jewish audience, they will know exactly what James is speaking about. It might seem harsh to you and me to start off with this statement, you adulterers and you adulteresses, but James is speaking about something that they were going to identify with, because James is saying to them, listen, you have been unfaithful to your God. You have departed from Him. You have committed spiritual adultery. Your love for God has been replaced with a love for other things. And maybe that's another reason why there was strife and division amongst them. Their hearts were far from God. They were backsliding away from God, and they not only broke the vows that they had made to God, they had broke the very heart of God himself. Beloved, such is God's love tonight. God does not want his blood-bought people to depart from him. Sometimes somebody finds themselves away from God in a backslidden state, and we can see how miserable they are, and sometimes we talk with them and we understand the hurt that they feel. Can you imagine how God feels? When he saves a child of God and he sets them apart, and their hearts on fire for God, and they're inflamed with love for God and love for Christ and for the work of God, and then all of that disappears. These people had been unfaithful. They departed from Him. Their love for God replaced by other things, and that broke the heart of God. If you and I know Him personally, which we do, every one of us, if our relationship with him tonight is not what it ought to be, then that's something individually that I just need to address. Because to depart from God and to know that you've done that and do nothing about it is a very serious thing. Firstly, James speaks about adultery. Secondly, James speaks about worldliness. Listen to what he says. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you know or not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. What a frightening statement that is. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? What's James speaking about by the use of this word, world? Well, he's speaking about a world that is apart from God. A world that is apart from God. Remember what the Apostle Paul said in using the same idea when he said this of Demas in 2 Timothy 4 verse 10? He says, sadly, Demas has deserted me. Why? Paul says, having love this present world. You and I might have differing views tonight about worldliness or what it means to be 
worldly. But there is one thing that is absolutely sure. The world can always and ever be a dangerous place for the Christian. Worldliness can be seen in many different guises. But the emphasis that James gives in these verses is simply this. A Christian cannot love the world and love God at the same time. If a Christian loves the world, James says, he is at enmity. He makes himself an enemy of God. Whenever you and I look again at the history of Israel, they were not only guilty of being unfaithful to God and committing spiritual adultery, but they were also guilty of adopting the standards of the nations around them. If you and I go back again to whenever God raised up Moses to be the deliverer of his people out of bondage in Egypt, whenever he brought them out and he gave them the assurance that he would bring them into the land, that he had promised to them way back in Abraham's time. And what did God say? He said to them, separate yourselves from all the other nations. Don't be like them. I have set you apart. You are mine. As I am holy, I want you to be holy. And way back in those times, the people not only were unfaithful to God, they adopted the state of those nations, the standards that they had. And such was the influence of those other nations, God's people were led astray. You know, the number of times I have gone and said to some people, listen, I believe you've been going here, or I believe you've been going there, or you've been doing this, that, or the other thing. You need to be careful because it'll take you away from God. The response is, I know what I'm doing. But the problem is they didn't know the draw of the world. They didn't know the dangers of the world. They didn't realize how subtle Satan was. And James says to these people, look, you're in danger of not only displeasing God, you're in danger of of departing from him. And if you depart from him, you will simply go back to that place from which God in his grace has brought you. And James says, not only would they be then the enemies of God, but they had chosen this position for themselves. You see, sometimes we meet people in a backslidden state. And sometimes we meet people who went well with God, and then all of that changes. And if you speak to them, they will turn around and say, well, it was the church, you know, the church didn't care, or it was the elders, the elders didn't do their job right, or it was the youth leaders. And on they go with a catalog of things to justify where they are. Men and women choose of themselves to depart from God. They choose of themselves to depart from God. And these people were doing that, and they were choosing this pathway for themselves. And James, he interacts to them, and he says to them, look, do you not know? Are you not aware as a believer in Christ that friendship with the world is enmity with God? In other words, to choose the world over God will make you an enemy of God. Whether we accept it or not, the world today can have such an influence on the people of God. We try to worship God with worldly means. We try to run the church as a business instead of a body. And we get engaged in all kinds of things that the church needs to stop and think, hold on a moment or two. Are we separated unto God? Are we the people that God wants us to be? The world is the enemy of God. Make no mistake about that. We should never forget this. 
Though I might well be misrepresented, but it's true because it's biblical. We should never forget as Christians, we have been placed in the world to bear a witness for Jesus Christ. If we don't live in the world and we don't try to reach the world, we're not doing our job. We have been left in the world and placed in the world to bear a witness for Christ. And that's not an easy thing to do. When everybody now is against the church, everybody has a voice about anything and they can say what they like until you're a Christian. And then you can say nothing. You're either a hypocrite or you're accusing people wrongly, or you belittle this community and that community. That's the world in which we live. And Jesus says, you be a witness there. But you're not off the world. And that's the difference. You live in the world, and you're here to bear a witness to the world. But you're not off the world. Because you're numbered amongst the redeemed of the Lord. The Apostle John puts it like this, 1 John 2, 15. Do not love the world or anything that is in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We have a choice to make, all of us. Our young people growing up today in a very difficult world, we all have a choice to make. Are we going to be conformed to the world? Or are we going to be transformed by the renewing of our minds? We have to decide whether we're going to live by the world's standards and its dictates, or whether or not we seek to live by the dictates of the Word of God. Ah, some people will say, but you know, God asks too much of me. Well, he gave everything for you. He gave everything for me. We're not our own. We're bought with a price. And ultimately, the choice that we make will determine what kind of Christians we are in this world, either we're worldly or we're godly. <clears throat> and if the world is our master, we're on a wrong pathway. We're in danger of departing from God. And if we depart from God, we cannot be the people God has called us to be. Thirdly, not only speaks about adultery, worldliness, James speaks about disobedience. He says here, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And then he says this, or do you think that the Scripture says in vain, the Spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy. That last phrase is worth considering. Here's another translation of it. Do you think that Scripture is meaningless when it speaks about worldliness being spiritual adultery and enmity with God? And James' point is very clear. James says that if you know what Scripture says about this matter, why choose to disobey it? If these people knew what they were doing was wrong, why would they continue to do it? If they knew that what they were doing was displeasing to God, why would they pursue such a pathway? Before I condemn them and their attitude toward God, there are times when I can be like them. Do we not often read things in God's Word that we know to be right? But we try to argue that they're wrong to suit the way we want to live? Are we not often challenged by God's Word in so many areas of life regarding things that are important in our walk with God, and yet sometimes we choose to ignore them? And we wonder why there's no spiritual growth, no ongoing development, no Christ-likeness. In a sentence, we simply disobey the Word of God. You know, sadly, some Christians have done that. 
their relationship with God at best is cold and careless. That didn't happen overnight. You know, one of the things that greatly concerns me about this past year and this pandemic, the number of people who have found it so difficult to keep going on with God. It's been a tough year. And I actually was speaking to a lady who turned around and said this to me. She said, you know, I get quite comfortable coming down in my house coat and sitting down listening to the Word of God on a Sunday. I said, yes, but you can't keep doing that because that's not fellowship. And others say, oh, well, you know, I can do what I like on a Sunday, and then I'll sit down through the week, and if I get time, I'll take a look at it. That's not fellowship, folks. Sometimes circumstances cause us to have to do certain things, but we shouldn't neglect the assembling of ourselves together because that can be the beginning of difficult times. Backsliding is usually something that happens over a process of time. If it's not checked, it can easily lead to disobedience to God and leave us someday further from God than we ever intended to be. I met a young woman at a funeral one day, and I asked her how she was doing. I hadn't seen her for quite a while. Oh, she said to me, I'm feeling great. I said to her, well, what about spiritually? How you doing? And she looked at me and she readily admitted to me that she was backslidden. And I said to her, well, could you give me a reason why it happened? And this is what she said. She said, I don't know. I just drifted away from the Lord. Christian friends, we need to make sure that we just don't drift away from the Lord. That could happen to anyone. That's why we need to look out for each other spiritually. If the lady who sits with you, if the man who sits across from you, if he hasn't been out for a week or two and you're concerned about him, either phone him or tell one of the elders and say, did you notice so-and-so hasn't been out for a little while. Better to get them early. Better to encourage them to come out to get their soul fed in the midst of difficult times. You say, but that's your responsibility, Pastor, and so there's two of you now. That's your responsibility. No, that's the responsibility of every single one of us. And if tonight we know of those who have drifted from the Lord, pray for them. Pray for them. And pray that the Spirit of God will rekindle the fire in them and warm their hearts and restore them to fellowship with us. James speaks about adultery, worldliness, disobedience, and fourthly, Jim, James speaks about pride. And I'll finish with this very quickly. He says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. I wonder, has James got in mind Proverbs 3.34? God mocks proud mockers, but gives grace to the humble. Isn't that amazing? That God resists the proud and he blesses the lowly. The word used for resists is another one of these military terms we find in the Scriptures. It means to arrange against. It's like a, an army that has been set up for battle. James stresses this fact because God hates pride. God hates those who have a proud spirit. But likewise, James says, he gives grace to the humble. One commentator rightly says this. He says, humility is the key to spiritual greatness. We don't often see much humility in our world today. Everybody is fighting for their rights, and if you're wrong or you don't agree with them, they'll walk all over the top of you to get their point out. Sometimes we don't see much humility 
in the church. We talk so much about our gifts, our endeavors. Sometimes people just cannot see God. James says God resists the proud, but he gives grace unto the humble. Or as the Lord Jesus said in Matthew 23, whoever exalts himself shall be abased, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. The problems that they faced. It might seem as if James is being harsh in what he says to them, the way he starts with them, the way he speaks to them. But these things were necessary, not just for them personally, but for them collectively. He speaks about adultery. He speaks about worldliness. He speaks about disobedience. And he speaks about pride. Next time, he gives us the pattern that we should follow. And that's much easier to deal with. Because what James says, look, this is how it is. And this is how we deal with it. And we'll pick it up there next week. Let's just pray for a moment. And let's ask God just to help us quietly in our own hearts. Father, if there's one thing we have learned from this book, it's difficult for us to hear. It's difficult to preach. Because these things, our Father, are very personal and they cause us to look into the inner recesses of our hearts and lives. And Father God, we recognize there are dangers all around us to the Christian regarding our Christian faith. Father, grant that we will never be guilty of departing from God. Grant, our Father, that we will continually separate ourselves from the world in which we live. Grant, our God, that we might be people who humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And grant, our Father, that our lives continually will be marked with obedience. Father, we need your help to do this. And our Father, if there are those listening in just now who have just slowly drifted away, we pray for them lovingly. And we ask, O God, that tonight you will start a fire within their soul again that would draw them out to your people, to come to hear your word, to be ministered to. And Father, that together we might grow in grace and in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Help us then just to ponder these things quietly in our own hearts and days to come. And we ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.